الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم على رسول الله um obviously we uh this whole week previous we had um Sidi Hakim speak at UCI um on multiple issues and it was a mashallah it was a beautiful turnout we had a lot of people show up non-muslims as well um we I think we but I I definitely benefited um one thing you put in that was was to increase blood flow is to bend your knees so in salam I'm going to keep my knees bent I walk it around like this when I come to the it's help I think Um, to give you a brief, I know you don't want to listen to me, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction uh, on the Sita Kim's uh, background, and then we'll just continue the program. Uh, Kim Archuleta has worked within the healing arts profession for 30 years. His interest in medicine and natural health and the study of God's creation began as a child. His, formal, his first formal studies were in the fine arts, which he studied in the 60s in Berkeley, where, he expert, where his expertise ranged from graphic arts to theater, cinema, and ethnomusicology. He subsequently converted to Islam in 1969, Uh, I'm not going to give you his age. Uh, he studied homeopathy and apprenticed with John DeMont in London and in the early 70s. He continued these studies in Berkeley, apprenticing with homeopathic doctors and working with the, the first homeopathic study in England. He continued his studies in the Middle East, England, and North Africa in the 70s. In 1978, he came with the Pakistan on the invitation of Hakim Mohammed Said of the Hamdard Foundation and studied there, studied there with various Hakims or traditional Islamic doctors. Um, his main teacher was Hakim Takiruddin Ahmed at the Niz Nizami Dawakhana, where he also learned pharmacy in, in the Unani tradition. So his special, specialization was actually in the Unani tradition rather than uh, homeopathy. It, home, I think uh, Unani is, is unique within the alternative field, uh, field of alternative medicine. There he earned the title of Hakim. Returning to the United States in 1980, he began teaching students privately, privately and established a family practice clinic in Santa Barbara. He has, conducted taught, he has conducted and taught study groups for homeopathy in Santa Barbara, California, Taos, Abiquiu, and Los Alamos in New Mexico for professionals and lay person. Uh, and, and, and is, this is this necessary? Can you all hear me? Yes. Can you hear me up there? Okay, I'll use this. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Well, there's not that much time I have in terms of what I would like to be able to relate to you from my own experience in this journey that he described, and that's quite, I find quite amazing. Having been a, 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 an American boy who grew up in Southern California in Manhattan Beach, I always say surfing USA, I grew up there and I was fortunate by Allah's generosity that I, I grew up in what I, I called at that time, this was in the 50s in Southern California, Manhattan Beach and Redondo Beach. You guys all know those neighborhoods, right? More or less, yes. Uh, I, I consider it the spiritual wastelands because at that time, the most interesting thing and the, most, the thing that people were most excited about at that time was the construction of Disney, Disneyland. So I went to Berkeley, though, and Allah is generous, and I prayed to God, and I said to God, Forgive me for wanting something more than what you've been so generous with me about in my life, that you've been so generous with so many things, but forgive me because I want something more, and I don't know what it is, but God, please show me what that thing is. And I prayed that prayer. I used to sing my prayers because I was a musician, and I used to sing my prayers on my own, and I prayed that same prayer for maybe a week. And I'm saying this to you because... I want you to understand, and this is an important part of understanding medicine, is to recognize and grasp the extraordinary nature of Allah's creation. That we sell short for the most part because we tend to confine it and limit it to a much greater degree than it deserves. Do you understand what I mean? Fabiya i Allah i Rabbikumma tukediban. The Surah Rahman, it says, which is it of the favors of your Lord that you're going to not accept that you won't be able to recognize. So I prayed this prayer, and I was sincere. I wanted something more than what I had. I wanted something more than Disneyland. I wanted something more than Corvettes and skateboards that were just being invented by <laughs> at that time. And I, so I prayed to God. I said, God, forgive me for asking for more, but I want more. And, I, and at that time, I met a Muslim. And the Muslim said, this is what Islam is. One, two, three, four, five. And dawah, you know how long dawah took for me from a Muslim? About 35 minutes. In 35 minutes, I knew this is what I was looking for because I'd asked God to show it to me. 
So the reason I say that is, one, because we have to recognize that this entire creation and every single thing that happens in it is by Allah's command. Every illness we get and every ease we have, every encounter we have, every entrance of this character from this side, everything, every catastrophe that happens, every wonderful thing that happens, every, every flower that blooms, everything we learn and discover, every person we meet, everything is by Allah's command. And His command is over everything. So we must not, for starters, in terms of our own health, in terms of healing and medicine, we must not limit by what we believe we know. We can use what we know, and we use our knowledge with common sense, but we must not limit the possibilities, first of all. So when I became Muslim, I had this double, wonderful double experience. One, of discovering Islam, which was incredible, because I'd studied many different religions, many different things, and when I discovered Islam, I realized this was an ocean of knowledge. No, an ocean of knowledge amongst the people. But the second thing I discovered were the Muslims, who were, for me, they were like people I wanted to meet all my life when I grew up in Southern California. I couldn't find them. I wanted people that could say with me and share with me a simple state and statement that now I, sh I, 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 I revel in and I, and I delight in, and that is alhamdulillah. To be able to say alhamdulillah, you must grasp I tell you, for someone who came out of a place where people do not say Alhamdulillah, and you know those people out there, but you've grown up for it with it for most part, most of you, and take it for granted. Do not take it for granted to be able to with, be with someone who you can observe something that happens in the world and to be able to say Alhamdulillah and feel it. Don't underestimate the value of that. So when I became Muslim then, I began to travel the world and look for teachers. I had a, a, a teacher who said I should do medicine. Not art, music, all the things that I was doing. And I was surprised, but he had the insight to know that this is an affinity I had from childhood. When I was 13 years old, I used to go out in the, 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 the fields and pick weeds that were edible weeds, and I'd bring them in and, try to, and make salads for my family and try to get them to eat. They wouldn't go for it. But. So I, I had an interest in in Allah's creation, the, the plants and the flowers and their properties and the qualities of them, and I had an interest in the physical body. So I began to study the body at a very early age. And so I had this background, and somehow this teacher knew that I'd had this interest that I'd embodied in my own experience long enough to know that medicine was something I would, I, I would either be good in or that I should do. And I was delighted to discover medicine. And a lot of my education from early on as a Muslim who was very inspired, you know, the, the converts. When you first become Muslim, it's, it's, it's like this world opening up. It's like a universe. It's more than that. Everything is a delight. Everything is amazing. And you, you don't forget easily that Allah's hand and Allah's guidance is there at every moment. And I used to pray. One of my ways of studying, I would study. I was in London. I used to study at the Wellcome Institute. Great library, of medical library. Like floors, layers, you know, floors and floors of... Thousands and thousands of books. I used to go there and study and read the old texts, find out about the traditional medicine. But one of the ways I'd also learn is that I would ask Allah, just like I asked God to guide me to something more than what I had, and he guided me to Islam, I believed that by sincerity, and sincerely like making dhikr, making salat, and then saying, Allah, you know, it, help me to understand what this kind of medicine is. What does it mean? By simply asking so I'm saying that because we, we forget, you know, the, the, we forget really that Allah is in charge of all of it. We have to pray and we have to ask Allah for what we want at all times. So I begin to travel the world and study medicine. But one of the things, that re, when I say I wanted before I was Muslim, I wanted to find people that could share the awe that I experienced in Allah's creation I wanted to be able to find people that I could with them say, Alhamdulillah. And I have that. And, I, and you know, I, I honestly, I appreciate it. <laughs> this is a great, great gift. But along with that, what I make a point of saying and stressing, because when I come to a group like, like this and I, and I have a short time to present things, what I like to sort of stress is what I consider 
really, really essentially important aspects to maintain health. The word health means what, literally? Well-being. Well-being would be, a, would be a definition, but the word itself, health, the actual word health, what does it mean? Literally. It comes from, and it's an English word, but the old form of it was holf. Holf means to be whole. Whole. What does whole mean? Complete. Complete. Whole means to have all of the parts that should be in place in place. Complete. Whole. And balance is part of that. Balance is something that comes when all of the pieces are in place. So the Prophet he said, in the body there is an organ. And when that organ is sound, the body is sound. And we can take that as a metaphor that, you know, we, are, we have an obligation in our larger body of our community, in the larger body of our world, to be sound that we may, in turn, enable the rest of our larger body to be sound. Are you following me on this? We must be well if our families are to be well. Our families must be well if our neighbors are to be well. If our neighbors are well, then our community can be well. We live in a time that we have to be realistic about. One of the principles of hikmah, of Islamic medicine, is that you have to be able to assess and evaluate the condition of a person or of an illness with realistic picture of what, uh, and assess and understand it before you can begin to accept, uh, uh, effect a cure. If a person is drinking poison every day, if you don't stop them from drinking the poison, it doesn't matter what medicine you give them, they won't be well, true? So one of the principles of the hikmah, of, hikmah means wisdom, but hikmah also means common sense. Common sense. So what, what I was, wanted to say is one of, the, one of the important things we have to get a grasp of is that the time in which we live is extremely, extremely, extremely out of balance. It's very extremely, extremely, I'm going to say it three times again, extremely, extremely, extremely not suited to what we were designed to be as human beings. And unless we begin to recognize and understand how and in which way that's the case, we will not be able to heal ourselves or the people around us, or the world, which is at this point not well. True or not? It's not well. And anybody who has the insight to understand the elements of what makes the world unwell, the prognosis does not look good. The prognosis is not good in terms of the emotional and spiritual illness that permeates the planet the spiritual and emotional illness that permeates this culture and this society that we're all living in here more than anything. This is, not a, this is a culture that suffers not only from physical obesity, it suffers from uh, lifestyle obesity. Too much. We cannot be well with that happening, period. And we cannot be well if our neighbors are not well. Just as the, in the body there's an organ, this organ must be sound if our bodies to be sound. Same thing, we, we must be concerned appropriately. Allah doesn't expect us to change the world, but on some level we have to work in that direction. We have to be of service to the suffering people out there. It is part of our own individual personal health. We have to be concerned about each other. But we live in a time, one sheikh, he said, the flood in the time of Noah was one in water, which people drowned from the water. The flood of our time is separation between us. And the degree to which we've lost that, set, lost that connection of family, of community, of connection with our own selves, the degree to which that's happened, we must not underestimate if we are to be able to assess the problem appropriately and then begin to change ourselves and the things around us to find a solution. We live in a time in which people have given up, inwardly given up. It's a time what they, it, some people, it's a time of nihilism, of, of, of hopelessness, somewhere. I mean, you don't always feel that, all of you. 
And we've, most of us have devised, particularly in this culture, devised a method to manage that, which is called avoidance. Weapons of mass distraction, they call it, right? I can't look at that. I don't want to hear about that. And so you get busy and you get, ob- you get, you get, uh, 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 you get, uh, you get engaged and ob- uh, you get caught up in whatever you're doing. And you use, we need those things to keep from facing the truth of what our children are up to, what they're facing, the condition of the, condition of the, 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 the seas and the fish. Do you all know that 90% of the fish are gone from, uh, from the seas that Allah created for us? 90%? So some of this comes into our consciousness and some of it doesn't. And some of it very carefully and sort of safely comes into the consciousness. So we, we can start being a little more responsible and we can start greening and moving in a green direction and all this sort of thing. But the truth of the matter is... This country has a, a problem of obesity, and the obesity is not this. We live in a time in which we have too much. We really do. And traditionally, all of the traditional hakims, they had to deal with these. these are, this is the condition of the wealthy, the wealthy and the, the, the spoiled kings and aristocracy of the past. We go into the market, and we can even go into the organic food market and say, ah, oh, I'm feel good about ourselves because we have all this organic food. But it's not like one or two things. It's like too much. Do you understand what I'm saying? Balance is what someone said. Balance. The Prophet always said, he was our model. He was the model, and we understand that he was the exemplary picture of the human being. I'm not saying you should not be happy with your BMW and your Mercedes. Allah is generous. I'm not saying that we have to do completely without that, but you have to recognize that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ended every day. What was his economy? What was his economic balance as he ended his day? What was it? What did he own? In his, what did he have in his coffers when the day finished? Zero. What did he have in the way of food? Zero. Because he gave it all out. That was the exemplary. Now, that doesn't mean we can be that way, but we can understand that that, if that's the exemplary, then what do we do? So we live in a time of obesity. What I have seen that through the years, 35 years I've been practicing medicine, in fact, now, I have seen that people become ill not because of germs that lurk in the hallway and this virus that's coming down from, that's going to jump on us if we're not careful. People become ill from attitudes that they carry in themselves, first of all. And I say to you all right now, in terms of what I want to leave you with, that's going to be most valuable to you in terms of good health. It's not black seed. It's not organic food. It's not this kind of fish oil. Those things are all true. We must know about those and learn about those. And they are part of the generosity of love, of, of Allah, as is Penicillin, or homeopathic remedies, or yoga, or massage therapy. But I say one of the most important and valuable medicines that you all need to recognize as a medicine is hamd. Hamd. Not with this idea that I'm going to be a good Muslim, so I'm going to say alhamdulillah, and I'm going to, I'm going to speak the words because that's what I'm meant to do but actually to feel hummed, to feel it genuinely. When you feel hummed in your being, the nervous system functions in a different way than if you don't. Depression is one of the, they say, one of the clinical epidemics of our time, particularly in this country. What is depression? Depression is, is, is the lack of being alive more than anything else. It's the lack of feeling alive. And a person that's depressed, they're not able to say, Alhamdulillah, with genuine sincerity. They can say it, well, I'm supposed to say Alhamdulillah, maybe. But to be able to say it and feel it, that will change the way you digest your food. Wallahi, hear what I'm saying. To eat your meal with someone that you appreciate and love 
will change the nourishment of that food. Period. So when I say you will not get good nutrition from McDonald's, it's because, it's because McDonald's doesn't love you. Your mama loves you. And that's why your mama makes the best food. And anyone who's mama-like will make food for you that is more nourishing than anything. It doesn't matter what it contains. This is not a little... This is And eating together, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, the one that takes the morning meal alone... What's the hadith? What did he say about that? Hello? Anybody? <laughs> he said, the one that takes the morning meal alone takes it with shaitan. The one that takes the morning meal with one other takes it with a tyrant. But the one who takes it with three or more eats with the prophets. Now, what's a better meal? <laughs> but we've forgotten the meaning of this. And we've developed a lifestyle for ourselves that does not suit us, does not suit our nature, our first nature. We are, along with everything else that Allah has given us, extraordinary position he's given us, the amana that he's entrusted us with. Along with that, we are also mammals. We're mammals. We suckle the breast of our mama, just like all mammals. That's part of the word, the mammal Suckles at the breast. And, and, and half a great huge number of people never suckle. They get a bottle instead. Or they get the breast for a short time and then they get a bottle. And then years later, the, the people who sell water try to convince you, you need all this water. They're, they're clever enough to know that if we make it like this, that it will really sell. You following me? No? But there are certain birthing in a natural way, death in a natural way, and life together in a natural way, eating together. I tell you if you, you, know, if you cannot find the strategies by which you can bring hamd into your being and live with it, if you cannot find the strategies that you personally can use to, to instill and infuse yourself with that hamd, at least feed other people. That is another medicine, feeding people, people you know, people you don't know. And that is Islam. The Prophet said that the highest thing in Islam is to greet the stranger, greet the stranger, to greet the stranger and feed the guest, feed the guest. These are medicines. I know many, many people in the custom in many countries, some of the countries that you, 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 you people have come from or your parents and ancestors, it was the custom. If, an, if someone had a very serious illness and nothing else worked, you would get all, a bunch of people, especially the poor people, bring them into your house and feed them, feed them, feed them really well. People would talk about dawah. They say, well, you're a, you're a convert, so tell us something about dawah. I said, you know, feed people biryani. That's dawah. <laughs> don't talk about Islam. You don't need to talk about it. Be Muslim. Be Muslim. And the Prophet said, he brought a healing for mankind. All of the prophets bought, brought healing and guidance for mankind. So what did he bring? What kind of healing and guidance did he bring? Was it spiritual? Yes. But it was also physical, social, familial, political, <laughs> environmental. He brought a healing for the entire planet. And his medicine was called... Islam. That's it. But we must be able to understand how do we take that Islam and use it to make ourselves whole and healthy? How do we make it real and serve us and, and, and give us guidance and transform us? He, Islam, he said, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. And that knowledge from the cradle to the grave was not collecting of information. He did not mean that. He meant knowledge of reality, knowledge of the truth, knowledge of Allah, and also that means knowledge of the self. And real knowledge of the self means when knowledge comes to you, when knowledge comes to you, you change. You change. Growth means change. 
Knowledge is growth, means change. That means we are not the same as we were you know, last week. We change. We are on the path of Islam, inshallah, but if we're on that path, then we need to use each other. We need to use all of the tools that we've been given in the guidance to actually affect change. So we're not the same persons tomorrow that we are today. I don't want that. We cannot be that. That means we're dying or we're dead. If we're not changed, I don't care if you're 65, 75, 85. It's from the cradle to the grave, right? And that is an aspect of health, growth. We grow physically from, until we reach a certain point of growth, and then the growth must happen inwardly. And if it doesn't happen inwardly, then we will not find fulfillment, we will not find peace, and our physical body will respond to that with sickness and illness. You following what I'm saying? And if we do not use the tools and each other for this process of growth, change, purification, if we do not do that, then the attitudes that we develop and that we carry with us, that we stubbornly carry with us, that we don't, that can't purify from ourselves, that will begin to affect the way our liver works, the way our kidney works, or doesn't work in this case. People have disappointments. We all have disappointments. One person said that the wise man is the one who laughs at death because he knows the person is going to their just desserts and rightful re results of the way they live their life. He weeps at birth because he knows this innocent being with such purity and ideals will face all this disappointment in the world and all this stuff that, they will, that will just try to dampen and shut down that, that uh, hope and ideal and all of that. So they, 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 they laugh at the death, weep at the birth, and they're silent at the marriage. But the attitudes we begin to embody. So someone is, is you know, a child uh, or any, you know, we all have gone through fear. We've all faced fear. As children, we face fear. One of the ways you deal, physiologists, people are familiar with, what, what's, the, what's the body's response to fear? Physiologist, what's the body's response to fear? What does the body do when it encounters? Huh? Heart, yeah. The heart, heart rate may go up, but usually the body also will rigidify. There's actually a particular posture. You know, the, the, the shoulders tend to go in. There's a, there's a tightening, a collapse, and a rigidification. The, the, the feet will turn in of real great fear. There's a certain kind of... So we all encounter, we all have this experience. Shock, fear, disappointment, anger, rage. And all of these things that we experience by being alive, if we do not, like, if we're not daily purifying ourselves with the salat, with the wudu, the wudu and the salat was designed by Allah to be able to wash that away and we come to square one once again of purity, of being. But if we're not doing that, if we're caught up so much in the world and our salat is one in which we're, we're preoccupied and thinking about something else and it's not really having its effect, then it may not and we be, be, may begin then to carry these attitudes so we become uh, we become. If, if we feel hopeless, we'll take on the posture of hopelessness. And we may not be obvious. It may not be, may not be that obvious, but it will be a little bit of collapse. A little bit of collapse. And that collapse will, again, mean that you know, the head goes forward. The, the whole upper body has to then learn how to hold the weight of the head up. Tension develops in all this upper mus musculature. And all that is obstacles to flow through, through the veins, through the art, all of the whole, all the place that blood wants to flow. When we, when, we, when we encounter difficult emotional things, mom and dad are fighting. For children, that's disaster. It's like a huge thing. I don't know if any of you remember that. Remember that if you, if, you, if you saw, you know, inshallah, you didn't see that. Inshallah, you saw your parents in loving exchange, which is medicine. To tell someone that you love them is medicine. To be loved by someone is medicine. There's not a better medicine in the world. 
that Allah's created. In terms of the physiological response, without any side effects. No warning on that label. No, no warning about side effects. Gambling or whatever else it might be. So, attitudes are, are, we begin to embody the attitudes. Fear, anger, anger, resentment. And we carry it, we carry it, carry it, and we don't forgive. It's another medicine. Great medicine is forgiveness. If people knew, and I see, you know, a lot of you are from the subcontinent, some of you are from Arab countries. These are what they call high, prof, high context cultures. Have you ever heard that? Any anthropologists in here? That, you know this term, high context cultures. It means there's a lot of specific details about the way you're supposed to behave. And if any of these things are out of place, like it's, it's unthinkable, like you've offended. Very, very, very complex and sophisticated cultures, high context cultures. But in these high context cultures where it's expected by uh, your adab and your behavior to, to express and, 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 and manifest respect, when you get to this culture where it's all out the window, you, want, you begin to think, well, people have no respect for their elders because of the behavior. They have no respect for each other. And so all of these things, resentments, contempt grows and builds. We're brothers and sisters. We have an opportunity, short time. How many more spring times will we see? Any of us, not many. Even you young ones. How many spring times? How many times to see those, the buds coming out and the flowers? Do you know? For a lot of people here, maybe 50, 60, Allahu alam, you know. Not that many, really. And how many days have we been given for the opportunity to reach out and be courageous enough to forgive our cousin, our uncle, our brother, our father, our mother, the, that one, this one, the neighbor, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? To do that is medicine. Because Allah's mercy descends on the one that does that. I met a man once in Atlanta, and he worked with gangs in Atlanta. And he told me this amazing story. He was in Southern California many years ago. Do you all, people know who the Bloods and the Crips are? Yeah. The young people know. Who, the Bloods and the Crips are gangs that have been in place for many, many years. It started in California. And this guy's son was killed in the Blood and the Crips battle. His son was murdered. He, he, he became so upset that he began to work as as a social worker amongst gangs to try to help and change some of the things. And then he moved to Atlanta. And then when he was in Atlanta, there was actually a Muslim guy. Anybody know that? Abdurrahman, the Muslim. He, uh, he set up a truce between the Crips and the Bloods in Southern California. It was maybe what, anybody familiar with this? Like 15 years ago or so, quite a long time ago. And when that happened, they, they contacted him and said, you should come and be part of the program because you've been working with gangs all these years. And there's going to make, there's going to be, we're going to make a truce between the Crips and the Bloods. And this is around the UCLA area, that kind of, a USC area. And so he came all the way from Atlanta. And he told me, this is the thing. He, had, he went to, for, to this thing, but his intention, he knew that when this truce was being done, that the murderers of his sons, his son was going to be there. And his intention was to come and take revenge. And... He came to the thing and it began, they began the whole, you know, speakers talking about how we should do this and the scripts. And some of the gang members got up and they spoke. And it was moving. People were moved by the fact that these people wanted to make truce. And he was so moved that it was time for him to speak. And he got up there and he said, I want to tell you all something. I came here with revenge in my heart. And I was going to kill my son's murderers. And he said, I want to tell you all something right now that I forgive you on the spot. And he said when that happened, his entire body changed and he felt something descend that was indescribable and he walked out into the parking lot and he said it was misting rain and he said he could feel peace. Like he'd never, and when he told me the story, I could feel the peace by his description of it. 
These are the things that we don't, these are the medicines, the name of the lecture the other night. These are the medicines we don't find in the drugstore, but that will change our being and will bring us well-being and good health. All of these things. The Prophet Sam was sitting with three, two of his companions, and one got up and walked away. And the man that was sitting with him said, I love that man. And the Prophet Sam said, then run after him and catch him before he leaves and tell him you love him. Don't miss that opportunity. And we become petty. We become petty about what this brother did or that brother. I, you know the story. You all know the story. I know fathers and sons that haven't spoken to each other for, for years. Brothers that don't speak to each other, for each other for years. The Prophet said, there's something higher. He said, shall I, to his companions, he said, shall I tell you something greater than salah and fasting? Something more and something greater than salat and fasting. And they said, of course. And he said, islahu dhat al Reconciling the differences between people. Making peace between two groups of people. But making peace in yourself is in your hands to do if you have the courage to do it and if you can recognize the value of doing that. If we knew the beauty and the wonderful thing to be married and to have a companion that said, has said, I will be with you as your companion for life. That single thing, nothing more. Not what they say or how they behave, anything. The very, just that single fact should be enough if we could recognize the truth of it. It should be enough to encourage us to want to wash their feet and be devoted and be thankful to God that that's possible. In Chicago, many years ago, when they had the big, big freeze, and some of these are coming up again, in Chicago, they 